Okay. What's flashing me back to late night call shifts and cold pizza on internal medicine teaching unit? My name is Jeff and I'm the host of this podcast, How It's Med. On this series, Physician Founded, which is made in partnership with Macadamian, we chat with physician founders who are shaping the future of healthcare. Our guest today is Dr. Joshua Landy, the inimitable co-founder of Figure One, a critical care doc and ice cream maker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got it. Uh, yeah, among a few other things, but like absolutely making ice cream is something I like to do, uh, when the weather's appropriate, um, I like to make some weird stuff. I like to make some regular stuff. And I like to take other people's recipes and improve them. Okay. What's your favorite flavor of ice cream that you've made before though? Mm, um, weird flavor. No, you know what? It's the same answer. Uh, the answer is, uh, matcha and Oreo, uh, which I call cookies and green <laughs> and it is. Unbelievable. Like the bitterness of the matcha and the, uh, you have to use a whole, uh, tray of Oreos though. You can't skip. Uh, and the, and the ice cream just turns out. That sounds well. delicious, but I mean, you're, you're, you're ripping that Kirkland sweater as we were talking about off air and I told you to save it. Oh, wh wh what's the story behind yeah. that? I, I mean, I love Costco, but. No, I think this is a great business play by uh, Costco team. Uh, they made these, um, Kirkland sweatshirts and they're, you know. They don't look like anything special. They're just black, uh, crew neck sweatshirts with the Kirkland brand on the chest. And they are incredible quality. Like this is Lululemon quality sweatshirt at Kirkland price. And what I want to guess is happening there is they were like, let's make a killer sweatshirt. Let's like make it $300 and we'll sell it to them for $35 and they will just blow their minds like at the amazing quality of Costco's brand, uh, because I will like, this is maybe the nicest sweatshirt I own. Uh, <laughs> maybe that says more about my, uh, taste in clothes than it does about Costco's quality program. Uh, welcome to how it's met a podcast where we talk about the benefits of wearing Costco clothes. Um, uh, gosh, how are you doing overall? <laughs> Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, I just came off like a uh, sort of multi week long stint in the hospital and, uh, you know, COVID's still raging and people Oof. still getting sick. Um, and it's busy, it's busy and I'm tired, but I'm glad to be off and joining you to, to talk about figure and one. And thank you for joining to talk about figure one and your experience in founding as well. Really excited to chat with you, but let's dive right in. Um, I mean. The, the, the question that I usually start with largely is, you know, what drove you towards medicine, but I'm just going to fold that into like, what drove you towards internal medicine and critical care, because there's so much to your story that I don't want to focus on this like origin story too much. Sure. Um, so I, uh, I knew I wanted to, uh, practice some sort of medicine yeah. with a lot of depth. And when you go through your rotations, um, the one that seems to have an unending pool of things you can know about and learn about is internal medicine. That was like a no brainer choice for me. Um, but within that, like, you know, I have this, uh, nerdy want to read about stuff, geek out on the specifics kind of side. That's my internal medicine. Uh, that's, that's why I liked mm -hmm. internal medicine, but I also have this incredibly impatient, only give me information that I can do something with side. Uh, and that's the critical care side, right? So being able to intervene in a moment when somebody really needs the help, that felt like the right time for me to participate because one, you can't wait, you gotta be impatient. And two, uh, there's loads of depth and, uh, critical illness, uh, can get really geeky if you want. Uh, and so talking about those types of physiology really drove me and my curiosity mad. And that's what I wanted to do, uh, with, with my career. Um, I loved the training. I thought the overall, the quality of education in the postgraduate medical education zone was okay, not great. Uh, and that's what sort of drove me to think about medical education as I closed out my mm -hmm, fellowship. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're really preparing me for my crimes interviews here. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> no problem. I guess I, I remember from my CTU days that internal medicine really was the core of, I mean, how I learned how to doctor. Um, so why did you choose to go down the route of the opposite side of that, which is medical education? Is it an inevitable part of internal medicine and care, or is it something that you've relished? 
Um, I think a lot about how the information is delivered yeah. to the learners, um, and what it actually means to have learned something like the, the, um, philosophy of knowledge and of education and the epistemology that surrounds it all. And, um, is, is interesting to me and not interesting to most people, but, um, I know that, um, I've had a lot of experience trying to teach things in unusual ways that have been successful. Like when I was, um, when I was in med school, I wrote a play about the ethics challenges that face medical students. Mm. Um, and we published it and then it got performed a few times, uh, and using that sort of medium to like express the actual real world experience of clerks and, uh, elective students, um, felt like a natural way to, to show that things are different when you don't know anything compared to when you are graduated and you know all the facts and you can present them confidently to your patients. Um, the first time you solve a problem you encounter all the learning because you have to learn how to solve it. And each problem is broken up into smaller pieces of information that you need to master and mm -hmm. communicate about. <laughs> and so you, you sort of enter this in a very different phase of your life when you're younger. And, uh, that always stuck with me that like learning something the first time is very different from refining your, your technique or your knowledge later on. Um, and because medicine is such a learn as you go kind of field. Um, it means that cases case-based learning is yeah. the only way it means that everything you learn, you learn by doing like physically being present, w w getting stuck to the problem and having to sort it out, yeah. um, yeah. the hard way. Yeah. Uh, so that sort of knowledge, like really threw me towards medical education in the field of like, how do we take these real world experiences of learning things the hard way? which by the way, you do an entrepreneurship too. Uh, and how do we catapult that, uh, into an everyday experience where people can conquer and collect the, uh, all the knowledge they need of these experiences, uh, and, and, and is there any way to compile that and deliver it to people as directly as mm -hmm. possible? So, um, the research that I did, uh, right after I finished fellowship was about what young physicians were doing with their phones. And it turns out they're mostly texting and emailing, uh, cases to each other. Now this is back in 2013, right? Probably no one's emailing cases to each other anymore, but that, that asynchronous behavior of, Hey, I saw this ECG. It looks weird. What's, what's going on here. And you text that to your senior, uh, or you're in a group chat with your attending and they go back and forth and you learn about, oh yeah, that's. Okay. If I see, you know, this particular PR segment elongation with inverted T waves, right? And now I'm thinking about pericarditis and now all of us have seen that ECG and the group learned from your experience of not knowing something. Um, so being able to package that concept and say, take all the cases from anyone who's seeing cases and has pictures of them on their phones and describing them to others, uh, that is what turned into. Uh, figure one, uh, which is a case sharing platform for mobile devices. That's fascinating. I was, you actually stole my, uh, my, my cat just walked on the screen. Um, that just, that really, I guess, sets the scene for where this all grew from overall, but figure one has grown so, so much since then. So, I mean, there's a huge gap between understanding that people share information on their phones, on medical teams and building a startup out of it. So how did these ideas fold into the founding of a startup or what were the circumstances or people that you had around you that allowed you to actually act on this need that you noticed? This is great. I'm so glad I get to tell this story. So, um, I graduated, I, uh, practiced critical care for uh, about a year. And during that time I was, uh, when you. Maybe I'll set the scene by saying when you finish your fellowship and you start practicing, um, there is a realization that you now have to figure out what to do with the rest of your time, because you're used to working five to seven days a week. And those days are not right. Those aren't eight hour days. Those are 10, 12, 16 hour days. And 
when you graduate, if you're a critical care doc, you get a week of work. And then a little later, you get another week of work. And then a little later, you get another week of work. And you are sitting at home wondering, what the hell am I supposed to do? I, I've got the next two and a half weeks off. I've never had, like, I've never had a break that long since second year med school when I took a research job instead of relaxing in the summer. So, um, you need to figure out like a whole new set of time management. Now this probably, you know, you can open a clinic and just work yourself every day if you mm -hmm. want. Um, but if you've got other stuff to do, like, I don't know, like learn a choreographed dance from a music video that you liked or watch all three matrix movies, I guess there's four now, uh, or like watch all seven Terminator movies. Yeah. Like you need some time. So you gotta devote yourself to your passions, uh, is what yeah. I'm saying. I just. Anyway, so I had this time and, and me and my buddies were starting to figure out some things we could do. And one of the things we could do is we could trade stocks and we could get a little group together to talk about it. And we thought, well, maybe we could formalize this and make it into like an official stock trading discussion group. And so we did, and we did that for a few months until we realized it was illegal. And then we had to, <laughs> we had to turn it off and we had to give everybody their money back. Um, in, it, you know, it, you know, just in full honesty, they, uh, changed the law while we had built the group. So it wasn't the illegal yeah. when we started. And then like a few months in, it was like, actually guys, you gotta not do this. And so we had to disband, but in that time I had come home from, uh, this research position, uh, at Stanford where, where we had studied these things that prompted mm -hmm. the idea of being able to share medical cases. And we were just going over the balance sheet together, me and my friends. And, um, we were talking about what we were going to do as we disbanded this group and what other sorts of businesses did we wish we could invest in. And we got to talking about possible startups and we got to talk about different kinds of technology. And I mentioned this idea and it was sort of one of those diner moments where everybody in the diner is quiet and you can hear the cutlery clink on the plate. Uh, and they go, oh, that's a pretty good idea, actually. And I was like, yeah, but like, there's lots of good ideas. And one of the guys at the table says, well, I could probably build something like that, like a prototype type thing in a few weeks. Uh, and he had just finished uh, working for a large uh, Toronto-based startup that was uh, uh, sold to a Japanese conglomerate. So he had a bit of time on his hands. And another guy said, I bet I could raise some money for something like that. And we said, all right, we should, we should circle back on this. And so we did like three days later, we had coffee and hashed out like, what is a company if it builds this case sharing platform for medical professionals? Uh, and we talked about it and we decided we were going to try and see how far we could get in a couple of months. So we all sort of split up. Um, did our own little jobs. And then by the time January rolled around, we had a prototype that we had shown to friends and family. We had a few hundred thousand dollars that were raised by those same friends and family, uh, including some of my colleagues. And, um, we just started the company. We hired, we hired somebody to help build our website and apply for grants. We hired somebody to help write the code that we needed to do. We hired some lawyers to help us sort out all the privacy situations about what it means to share medical cases in a privacy safe way. How do we protect those privacy, um, elements? And then we waited till all the legal stuff was worked out and May, 2013, the app was in the app store. That, I mean, you, you said that you had helped write a play before, but you could totally write a screenplay out of this. I, I truly believe that. <laughs> um, or you're just a very, very, very good storyteller or both. But, um, you know, just talking about that journey from that point, in the startup to where you are now, like, what are the biggest challenges that you, and perhaps your team faced in growing such, like such an enterprise? Mm, um, there's like a million challenges and I don't want to gloss over the hard ones in order to tell you about the easy ones so I can look super successful. Um, but I mean, in truth, one of the hardest parts is getting people to try it out because you, you know, you might approach people with your idea and say, Hey, we got this 
case sharing app for mobile devices. And, uh, they say one of two things, they say, oh, that, that is a good idea. Or they say, oh yeah, I thought of that too. I'm like, okay, well, like, where's your app? Um, but to convince people to actually download it and try it out, especially when it's brand new, um, not everyone in medicine. In fact, I'll say almost nobody in medicine is a true early adopter. And so I think this is, um, you're, you're tilting your head because I think you maybe see yourself and maybe your colleagues as early adopters. Um, um, I was going to um, ask why is that, but I, I, I'm answering that in my head right now, but I'll let you speak. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think the answer is that, uh, in healthcare, in, uh, in medicine, in hospitals and in universities, uh, the mindset is around, uh, safety and consistency and not around innovation and, uh, rapidly iterating and changing scenarios. And I think that's part of why healthcare has, uh, a safety reputation to uphold is they move slowly. So they don't make any mistakes because in business you can make tons of errors. And in fact, you're probably supposed to, in order to get stuff right quickly, but that's not the case in medicine. You can't just like go around trying a bunch of things to see what works. No, you gotta use what you know works. And by the way, if you use stuff that you know doesn't work or you don't know if it works or not, but you had a good alternative, you know, you've done a bad job and you're gonna get in trouble. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. So, yeah. So I think that's why, I mean, it's not a natural fit. Like innovation in healthcare are not, a, they're not a great fit. Um, but of course, you know, research keeps going like academic research, uh, takes somewhere between seven and 17 years to take a discovery and turn it into a product that's out in the marketplace. But when you've got this idea in September and you want to make it an app before November, right? You, you can't go through the, like, I don't, you don't have time to do that kind of research. I mean, the mobile wave would have been over mm -hmm. if we waited that long. It's only been what, nine years since we started the company. We could still be, we can still be writing the papers for the initial research if we went at the same pace as, uh, academic innovation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've asked this question time and time again with regard to academic innovation. Um, and there, there have been a lot of different answers. Some people in the medical device space have said, you know, do your academic research to build clout so that you're able to work your way into a role as a CMO, et cetera. But it seems like your way of doing it is just, if it's, for example, a community-based teaching based solution, then perhaps going the regular route is too slow. I mean, yeah. I think that's true. It, it would have been certainly for me and for my yeah. level of patience. Um, but you know, it depends what the solution is. Our goal was to avoid invoking, uh, the type of, um, research and, um, I don't know. We wanted to avoid spending so much time doing any of these things. And so we said, we're not going to sell to hospitals. We're going to put this app on the phones and in the hands of providers, because they're just going to be able to download it from the app store. Um, but sales cycles to, uh, academic institutions can be years long. Um, procurement was something that one of my, one of my co-founders, his family had gone through so many procurement cycles because his family's business was building tools oh in healthcare. And he Boy. said, you know, when he decided he, when he just, when he went to business school, he said to himself, I am never doing a healthcare startup ever again. And then it was like the first week he had finished school and I was like, figure one. And he was like, all right, figure one. <laughs> but, but you know, it was on the agreement that we were going to put this in the app store. We were going to put this in the hands of providers so people could adapt, adopt it rapidly because we didn't want to go through those procurement cycles mm -hmm. or those sales cycles or the academic cycles. You show this to 20 people, it works. You share a case, you see them talking about it and it works. That's the job. The job is to talk more about medicine. What pushback did you face? Because I know you mentioned some people are like, oh, you know, I thought of that already, um, et cetera. But I think emotionally, one of the hardest things to deal with is a, a, a lot of the criticism that you can handle, but criticism may just be passionate disagreement in some form that can actually help you grow your startup. But Back to the point, what was, what, what were some of the criticisms that you faced early on that you had to deal with? Um, well, uh, the privacy one was one we knew we okay. were going to run into. And so we prepared heavily so that 
anytime, uh, I was doing press for the, for the app, um, or for the company, we would, we would, we would set it up. So they would ask us about privacy in a way that maybe they would feel like they were about to get the upper hand, but it was a trap because we had built our app with privacy in mind. I mean, we literally, uh, the process we used was called privacy by design. And it meant that our servers could be hacked our everyone's app could be compromised and still no private information would be available. Um, this is all on my, uh, co-founder's brilliant, uh, suggestion, something that he discovered in his years of professional communication, working at the UN that, um, the best way to keep a secret is not to know it. So we just said, all right, no privacy information on this app at all. We don't want names. We don't want case numbers. We don't want birthdays, anything that could potentially be similar to a HIPAA violation, no unique jewelry, no tattoos. And this was like, these are, uh, you know, in 2015, this was rigid privacy, um, because there wasn't a lot of innovation in the space. So creating a tool like this and sort of saying, yeah, we'll go first, we'll try it out. Um, meant that we had to be really strong in privacy. So that was something that we faced early on. Um, and we just, you know, uh, prepared our defense and led people into uh, into asking us the questions so that we could appear strong in our responses. That's really interesting. I mean, I think a lot of that must have taken coordination between your team members and yourself with the skill sets and insights that are unique to who you all are or were as individuals. So it kind of leads into my next question, which is what roles um, did you play and what roles did you not play or were delegated to your teammates? Because as physicians, it's easy to say, I, I, I want to try to do it all but you, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and physicians, by the way, are particularly bad at this. I've seen a number of physician run startups yeah. where the docs like, oh, I went, I'm smart. I have people skills. I can do any of this. Um, and I think that's a problematic assumption because, uh, you can't it, like, you literally can't do everything on your own. You need a team and you need to be able to trust your team. Now that said, like at the beginning, we were a team of three people and then kind of quickly, we were a team of five people, but that's not a big team. Like that's a team you can get your arms around, uh, literally and figuratively. Uh, and you can, uh, you can, you can sit down and say, how are we going to deal with this problem? What, what, what pieces of this, can I give you this part of my job? Uh, can I take away this part of your job and do it myself, uh, so that you can take on something else. Um, and you know, I knew that I was going to be really happy with a role where I get to talk about how this could change medicine and talk about how this could change education. And I could talk happily about how it would integrate into the clinical role. And I would happily do all of that, uh, with, um, improvisation because, you know, I had had like, I, you know, I, like in university, I was a bit of a theater kid and I did a bunch of like, you know, acting and improv and like this writing and I directed a bunch of stuff. In fact, my co-founder, uh, he was a, he was a playwright before I was, and, uh, I produced and directed several of his plays I, as an undergrad. Um, so we were friends from yeah. like summer camp way back. Um, but sort of, we, you know, so we had, we had already had a kind of working relationship where he was going to be the one who sort of drew up the plans for how the whole thing was going to go. And I was going to get to embody it or envision it or create it. Uh, and then, so this was sort of a recapitulation of that same dynamic with the added benefit of having a technical co-founder who's now one of my closest friends who was able to advise us on this works, this doesn't work. Uh, when you want to build it, you have to be careful of this and privacy me in technicality means this. And so when you're talking to the press, uh, you know, or investors, to be honest, you know, you throw in a term from here, you, you add something that you learned, you throw, you know, you pass it to your teammate when you're, when they're ready to talk about their piece. Uh, and the whole thing feels a bit like, I don't know, some sort of intellectual sport on us. That's fascinating. Huh? I mean, okay. So in, you, you, you yeah. mentioned there that your role was essentially to some extent evangelizing how figure one could change medical education. Um, You've said before that you continued your role in medical practice when you were running figure one. 
Um, did that help in what you were doing? And how did you, I guess, balance both a medical career plus helping run a startup? Because both of those are considered full-time jobs. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's for sure. Um, I was really tired. I was really tired. Like I would finish a shift, you know, at 8 a.m. And then I would drive home, hop on the subway and go downtown to the startup office where I would work for a couple of hours, fall asleep in my chair for a couple of hours, then work for a couple more hours and then go home. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, it was kind of challenging sometimes. Um, but to like, to answer your question, I, I really did struggle with that balance and I still do even today. Um, because what I don't want to do is become an annoying colleague at work to the people I work with in my, um, clinical job by telling them, you know, download my app, try this out. Uh, can you, you know, can you give me feedback? Do you have 20 minutes to be in a user interview session? Um, you know, and you end up asking the same 30 people a hundred times, you know, in the space of a year. Um, I just didn't want to pretend that my app was a success before it was successful. And I wanted to make sure that I could, I could keep my clinical arena, um, available in case figure one mm -hmm. didn't work out. Um, because a lot of folks in, uh, in startup, uh, they endeavor to leave their clinical yeah. practice. And that happens sometimes way too early. Um, and if you are, if you leave, it's really tough to come back. Um, you know, both license wise, depending on how long you've got been gone, but also reestablishing the connections, getting a job, uh, having people like refer you patients. If, if you practice, uh, if you have an outpatient practice, I mean, um, so, you know, I wanted to go around and evangelize the use of figure one throughout the, the hospital that I worked at. Uh, but I, I, you know, I told people about it, but I, you know, I didn't ask if we could like put a table in the cafeteria and hand out t-shirts. You know, maybe that was an error. Maybe we would have more users now if we did that. Um, but it just felt like, you know, um, with a little perspective, you know, adding a hundred users from one institution would be great. But when you're trying to gather 10 million users from every country in the world, minus the countries you're not allowed to publish tech in, um, you know, those, those hundred users are really worth the mm -hmm. risk in the long term. Um, you know, we're, we're based in Toronto and there was a lot of encouragement to, uh, interact with the Ontario government and get in touch with the ministry of health and talk to the university of Toronto. And while we didn't mind initiating any of those conversations and many of them actually went pretty well, um, our market was the whole world. And out of the few thousand users we could gain locally, um, we really, we're going to see a lot more growth, putting our efforts elsewhere, but sometimes it's hard to convince local people that the larger picture is more than yeah. local. That's a really insightful comment, but what, what I do want to try to talk about here largely is you, you, you talked about trying to spread the word uh, as to how figure one could change the future of medical education, but you noted that you didn't necessarily do it work because again, like I can understand how that might be, you, you didn't want to be annoying essentially. So how did you leverage your insights and credentials as a physician in your role as a CMO of the company? Um, were there any particular stories that, that, that you have that you can share? Because what I'm trying to understand is the different, I guess, roles or I guess, ways that CMOs can employ their knowledge and experience. Right. So, um, I think some of the more valuable, uh, parts for like other, uh, medical entrepreneurs would be that my role was to like in investor meetings, my role was to put to present like a true clinical view from a practicing yeah. physician and, uh, and to provide that like gravitas, right? So we would sort of have this, uh, routine where I would talk about, um, how certain conditions are visualized and differentiated from each other, but you have to learn by okay. looking at them and being able to sort of like bring that view into an investor meeting and to, you know, and to say, uh, just to say the words pyoderma gangrenosum 
And then everyone's like, oh, I, I don't know what that is. I, we got to listen to this guy. Uh, right. So that, right. That sort of gravitas, uh, brings, makes a huge difference and it makes a huge difference when you're in the, talking to press and it makes a huge difference when you're talking to colleagues, because I don't know who from our company could have gone to medical conferences to discuss the value of a tool like this, uh, who wasn't a practicing gotcha. clinician. Um, so going to, you know, being able to apply to conferences and being able to say to people at universities, Hey, let's do, let's do, a, let's do an education study together. Let's, let's take some of your learners and run them through a program designed by figure one. And, uh, you can also compare that to how it performs when you give them a lunchtime lecture with free mm -hmm. pizza. Like you're not going to be surprised to hear that, that it works better when people are engaged on their phones than it does. Uh, to have people disengaged in a lecture hall. So being able to like make those approaches and make those partnerships and, uh, speak to your colleagues, like from other institutions on a level, uh, and with the vocabulary and the, the, I don't know, that sort of like instant trust you get with another person of the same profession. Um, do you, do you know what a, a shibboleth I, is? I, I see it in my, in my, in my. Uh, you know, search tab when I go to the UBC website, but no, I don't. <laughs> I think that's the name of a, a, a tech product, but it's, it's named after, um, it's a biblical reference, but the, the story is basically, uh, that, um, you would have to pronounce this particular word in a particular way to be known to be part of a particular population. Mm. And, um, and if you didn't pronounce it right, they would know you were outsider. And more or less, that's what it's like when you talk to colleagues, uh, someone calls you and says, you know, can I talk about a patient? And you say, sure, I don't know you, but go ahead. And within like a couple of sentences, you get the sense of whether this person knows what they're talking about or not. You get the sense, like, this is a person who like went through the same experiences I did, or like has the same framework for looking at these that's things as I do. Uh, and those like implicit. Uh, cues. um, cues give you, uh, give you a lot more information. This is like thin slicing versus thick slicing. If you've ever thought, heard of that psychological discussion topic, um, I haven't, <laughs> no, you haven't. Okay. Um, there was like this study where like, they got a bunch of people to like, look at somebody's room and the contents of their room and look deeply into like, they read their diaries and they looked at all their pictures. And they examined all their clothes and whatever, some sort of like in-depth analysis and had those people answer a questionnaire about what this person is like and what, what do they do and mm -hmm. what do they prefer? And then they had another group of people do a much more superficial analysis, much shorter. Look at the person's room, look at how their closet is organized, uh, look to see what pictures are out, look to see what their handwriting looks like, but the, you know, you don't read anything in depth. And one was called the thick slice because you, you got a lot of information. And one was called the thin slice because you didn't. And they compared the two and the thin slicers outperformed the thick slicers. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's like, it's yeah. the same shibboleth thing, right? You sort of like, you get the impression, you get the gist of like wh what this person's yeah. framework is, but you don't bother over-interpreting mm -hmm. details. Anyway, that's like a no, huge No, that's digression. fascinating because I mean, that, that shows really what the value of a CMO uh, when it comes to sharing a product or a concept with colleagues is you gain that instant trust because there's those implicit cues that show that you're one of them and there's trust, I guess that can be converted into action or collaborations that leads to the growth of a company, um, or the growth of an idea at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It just, I mean, it changes the way you talk to people if they trust you, right? You go from being a used car salesman. Uh, where you're sort of like shilling your products to being a genuine and honest conversation where you say like, I need people to test this out because I've spent so much time looking at it that, you know, uh, you know, I, my view is completely biased by all the work that I've put in. Can somebody please look at this and tell me if you think mm -hmm. you'd use it? And with a, with a plea from a colleague who you understand, who seems like they know what they're talking about, you're going to get a lot further than somebody who says, try this app. It's going to change the future. Ready, set, go. Or like, I don't know, whatever people say. Um, so, I mean, we've talked a little bit about the interactions that, I mean, the, the interactions, the roles that you're, you had with your, that you shared with your different team members, but we haven't really talked about the, the hows 
of the growth of figure one. Mm. So I read that you went down the incubator route. Um, can you detail that experience in a bit of depth so that, um, I guess the audience can understand what that was like and why you made that choice? Sure. Um, we joined an incubator because th this was, uh, in a, maybe a different phase of mm -hmm. startup life where, uh, incubator, the, in the incubator we were in offered funding as well, and they offered free office space. And that's not always the case. Now, sometimes it's just like they offer you business education, but you still, you have to pay for your own office space and that's it. Um, and we did that for first five or six months. I think they gave us six months of free office space and then quoted us a rate for afterwards, which was really like, it was cheap office space. We could have stayed there. Um, but my, my colleague, my co-founder, the CEO said, no, we got to get out of here as soon as possible. Like the goal of being incubated is leaving. Right. Um, and so it was, it was unthinkable that we would want to stay in that environment because we had, we had shit to do. Like you gotta get out there and, and like sell your app. You gotta build it. You gotta support your platform. You have to evangelize it. Uh, but a lot of these things, like when you're meeting with advisors every few days to like review the metrics that they think are important, um, you sometimes like, if you have the vision inside your company already, um, you, you could lose it or end up substituting it for someone else's judgment, uh, until they think yeah. you're ready. And so we, you know, we were there, we appreciated the office space. We didn't do much socializing with the other, uh, I mean, it was nice to have people around to like chat to and have coffee with, but like it, it wasn't our startup life began after we, hmm. after we left was sort of how I think about it. Like that was a place where we could actually just sit down and flesh out the idea to see if we could actually get something started. Uh, and before we left, we had, you know, we had launched our app. We had the first, I don't know, 10 or 20,000 users of our app, um, which happened very quickly after launch. Um, but beyond that, we didn't, we didn't stick around. And that's the advice that I give to every startup that I meet with now as an advisor to, uh, nearly the very same incubator we were in. Um, like stay here only as long as you need to, and then get out because your job is to find a way to turn this company into a business, which means you have to be able to support yourself financially. You have to be able to complete sales cycles. You have to be able to launch and ship features and you have to do it fast and you have to do it on your own. Um, because once you get a little bigger, uh, no one's going to tell you what to do. You mm -hmm. just have to figure it out. So to summarize that, correct me if I'm wrong, an incubator for your team was kind of like a safe harbor from which you could grow, but that safe harbor by definition was limited by the space, not only like in terms of actual space, but also the space of ideas, um, that, that it had, and you needed to expand or move out if you wanted to ever grow figure one beyond a startup that lived in an incubator space. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's not a bad summary. I mean, I, I definitely, um, could use more summarizing, uh, <laughs> um, I think that's right. I mean, your goal is to be independent. So get independent as yeah. early as you can. That's really, you know, your goal is to be successful, get successful as early mm -hmm. as you can. Um, don't, don't rely on crutches cause they're not going to be there for long. And if you accidentally develop a, um, like, uh, a dependence on those factors, uh, you're going to be stuck where you didn't realize Just the a thought that popped in my head was that, is, is there any parallels between that and moving from being a, a, a relatively supervised student in medicine, um, to someone who practices independently? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I, and I think a lot of folks enjoy being in that semi-supported, um, realm of the sort of in between of being like a junior attending or a, a senior fellow, um. You know, people will sometimes even do an extra year just so they can get more comfortable. And I think your job is to get to a space where you're just a little bit more uncomfortable. Like go right up until you're, until the end of your comfort and take one more step because I bet you can do it. And if you apply that thinking to your clinical life or your, your medical practice, or your education and your startup and basically anything else, I think you're going to grow your capacity and your capability. Mm -hmm. So. Um, make yourself uncomfortable, get into a space where you have, you're forced to learn, learn, be successful. Yeah. Okay. 
I think that's a good parallel to, to, to clear the conversation up, um, for some of our physician listeners, but I mean, just to talk more about the growth of the, uh, of the company overall, part of the growth is being able to secure funding. So you're able to scale. Um, and we've had the chance to interview some investors, but we've never really talked about building relationships with venture capitalists or investors overall on our pod. So what has your journey into building those relationships been like? And does your background in medicine pose any boons or challenges? You talked about the, about the boons in terms of being able to say pyodermic gangrenosum, right? But other than that, <laughs> how did your background affect those interactions and how would you navigate those interactions if you could go back now? Well, I certainly didn't do them on my own, right? Most of our investor relationships were done by my uh, CEO, like the CEO colleague, um, yeah. my co-founder, Greg, uh, who had experience raising money, uh, cause his family was in medical tech startups. So he had, you know, he had not only seen his dad do it, but he had participated in a lot of these things in the past. And so knew the types of channels he had to develop. Um, that was something that you had said that sort of like made me, oh, it was some people end up staying in incubators for a long time because they're, you know, they have to find ways to raise capital so they can become independent. And, um. I don't think there's like a really easy way to say this. So I'll just like blurt it out. Most people's startups aren't great ideas and they don't execute that well. And they should like keep adapting their idea until it hits. Right. And sometimes that takes a long time. We were lucky that ours was successful fast. Um, but we, by the way, we built another app for another purpose in a totally different realm of medical health tech. Um, while we were waiting for our app to be approved in the app store, like with the lawyer and stuff, it actually took months, but, um, but like we were ready to like pivot to a new company. If this one was not successful, like we were ready the following week, if it, if it launched and flopped, we were ready to go with something else. Um, something totally unrelated, uh, except that it was also mm -hmm. for doctors. But the point is, um, like not everything's going to hit. And just cause it's a beautiful idea in your mind. It it may not actually be a good idea in reality, and you may not be able to get enough people using your app and tell you it's great because maybe it's not that great. Um, so, you know, you, you sort of want to prepare yourself. That's the hard part for most people. And I think we were mm -hmm. incredibly lucky. Um, but I don't want to skimp on the investor advice. So, um, you know, we were lucky because some folks came to us. We were lucky because we were in an investor connected incubator and we were able to be introduced to people. We were lucky because we had uh, early signs of product market fit. Like we launched on, on a Monday and on the Tuesday, we were on the front page of one of Canada's national newspapers below the fold, below the fold, but still below the page, fold, though. right. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> but like, you know, and then it was, it was up on dig and it was up on mashable within a week. And, uh, we all made bets and lost bets about how many users we were going to get because we got more than we thought. And we, to be honest, we weren't ready for that kind of influx of users. Um, and we built a bunch of stuff really fast. Um, and there was a bunch of really weird errors that first couple of months that it was out. Um, but that was, that was like, we were really lucky to have all those things and they sort of fell into place. And so when we went to investors and we said, what do you think about this? They said, great, let me introduce other people. Um, and in the end, we, we lucked into an incredible group. Uh, of really supportive investors who were able to coach us and guide us and help us understand how to build a product and how to build a business and how to do and how to do accounting, uh, in all the ways that we didn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I think that world in itself seems so far detached from the world of medicine overall. Did you have any apprehension walking into those rooms? with the venture capitalists, with the investors at any point in time, and were the investors that you stuck with at the end of the day, those who you felt most comfortable with, because they were those who you could work with as partners, as literal people who owned part of your work. I wish I had had more knowledge then. I mean, I think I went in way too hot, uh, and went in like way too confident. And I mean, maybe that helped, but. Uh, if I started a company now, um, I would not be presenting with half the confidence, despite having 10 times mm -hmm. the knowledge. 
right? It was a, it was a, I, it, like for me, these, these were all Dunning Kruger moments early on. Yeah. Right, where I just thought I knew what was going on because things were going kind of well, but no, I didn't know what, what I was doing. Um, so I, I mean, yeah. you talk about <laughs> confidence there, and I think confidence is actually plenty important when it comes to actually being able to seize the moment and seize the resource at hand. I mean, that's the first mover advantage, right? But I mean, mm -hmm. something that you also talked about before in your previous answer was about being able to adapt, having that second app ready. Like that in itself emphasizes the importance of speed, at least in my opinion. How important was speed in terms of how you executed or how your team executed figure one? Because I recognize that physicians or physician founders can be limited in their time, which means that their teams may not be able to move with as much speed as they may need to when it comes to founding and pivoting a startup. Yeah. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that I was hmm. not the CEO, right? So I was not taking... Like the days when I, or the days or weeks when I was either working or away or overnight somewhere and non-functional the next day, like those days didn't detract from the administrative moving forward of the business, right? If there were deals to be done, if there was investor calls to make, I could join them when I was awake uh, or in town. But if I was away, um, I was, I was the medical co-founder. I was expected to continue practicing. And this was a, like basically a group decision between me and my two co-founders that I should stay in practice because that had not only, uh, value to me being able to give input to the product to say, I would use it this way or that way based on what I do. Um, but it also legitimizes your, um, your efforts to improve the world. Like if you are, um, it's tough to leave a group and then say, you want to fix that group. Like you can't leave medicine. You can't fix you medicine by leaving medicine. Right. Right. So you got to stick around, which means you got to devote like, right. Medicine's not a great part-time job. You sort of have to do it most, most yeah. time. Um, and then like, do you still have the capacity to make these administrative decisions or, or decide on how your company is going to be structured? Like, I don't have any knowledge about those things. I had to defer a lot of those decisions to my more knowledgeable co-founders. Mm -hmm. I was lucky I had them. I mean. I'm I'm just looking at the time right now because I, I know that we're running out. But the the main things that I do want to delve into are some of the um features or some of the impressive things that you've built with Figure One. Um, number one being the community around it, and number two, the paging system, which frankly, correct me if I'm wrong, relies on a sense of community as well to be reliable. So I mean, let's talk about community. How do you grow out the community in terms of size? Um, and get penetration so quickly. Part of it is product market fit, but were there any specific tactics that you use in terms of building it out? Um, we took a lot of advice mm. from our users. Um, and when we felt we were ready, we hired somebody to, um, manage our community, to listen to them and give us feedback. And, um, she was like one of the most empathetic people I've ever met, but was also able to give like very incisive feedback about this feature isn't working for our users or they're blocked at this phase. Can you, you know, can we create a, a feature that can help solve these problems? Right. So, um, we watched very closely about how people were using the app and said, they're trying to do this. The, the fact that you mentioned paging, uh, is great because paging was one of the best it was one of my favorite features. Uh, I'll describe it in a sec, but it also came from, uh, my co-founder looking at something in the app and going, Hey, look what these people are doing. They're doing something here. Can we help them out a bit? And, uh, so paging is a feature that essentially, uh, you can upload a case and request the feedback of a specific service, right? So if you've got, uh, somebody with a swollen joint, you need someone to look at it you might want to talk to a rheumatologist. So on figure one, when you upload a case, you can tap on the paging feature and select that you want a rheumatologist and that case will get sent to all the active rheumatologists and everyone who's on the app will see it right at the top of their feed. And it says, this case needs the advice of a rheumatologist. Can you help out? Okay. We called it paging because you're paging a specialist, just like you would in an old school hospital switchboard. I mean, doc, it used to be doctors and drug dealers who used pagers and now it's just doctors. Um, and so, um, that feature was essentially discovered when my co-founder was looking over the, the, uh, 
I think it was an ortho case, uh, or a radiology case. And it was a, an arm or a leg that had a fracture in it and somebody, and they were just like, um, I think they were maybe even like, as a joke, people were like, is there an orth, is there an orth, is there an orthopedic surgeon in the house? Is there a radiologist around like paging radiology? Like, okay, yeah, we can, we can do that for you. No problem. We'll just put the case in front of all of those specialists and set them a push notification. Great. Paging solved. Um, we also realized that people were starting to follow cases by just adding the word following as a comment, because users all by themselves just realized that if you commented on a case, you would get updates when there were more comments. And so if the answer was going to be in the comments, you wanted to hear about it. And so sometimes you'd go into an un unusual case and there would be like, 20 or 30 people just typing the word following as their comment. Ah, you know what we need? Says my co-founder, we need a button called following. Okay. So we built a button called following. So you didn't have to add a comment. You could just press the button and get updates. All right. But those sorts of things, like we just added the features that our users were trying to do and it helped them feel like they had agency in what this community was going to be able mm. to do. So, I mean. We also gave out t-shirts. Uh, it it, it must be the t-shirts. It must be the t-shirts. <laughs> Kirkland? <laughs> I wish. I wish, we, I wish um, we had known. So, I mean, it seems like even though healthcare, healthcare workers have so little time to give usually because they're so busy, they were willing to give time because, I mean, they, they, they were colleagues there who were willing to give to each other as well as the team that was willing to listen. Are there any other integral parts of building a community that you think are important to emphasize? Um, I mean, we also made errors and like screwed up building the community multiple times. Uh, maybe that's more helpful to hear about. Um, you know, we tried to add, we tried to give badges to people to show that they were like engaged members of the community. Um, and realized that people wanted the badges more than they wanted to participate in the community. And so people would do all sorts of bizarre behaviors to, uh, get the badge, right? Like they would add a bunch of nonsense comments on one case and just dump them down deep in the threads so that they could increase their comments and the responses to comments, because we were using that as one of the metrics. So, you know, we changed the algorithm for what it meant several times. And a bunch of people lost their badges and then a bunch of people got super mad at figure one for like all of this, what they felt was a huge mess. I mean, if you look at the app, like even at, at a small distance, you saw no meaningful change to the way the conversations were happening. But now we've identified what we thought were like our, you know, hundred or 200 most engaged users. And then we made them really mad. And then the people who used figure one the most Ooh. got really mad at us and we had to like put out a bunch of fires and some of them we couldn't put out and those people left the platform after swearing at us for a long time and it's the internet. So like you can't please everybody and you end up realizing that communities are made of people you mostly don't know and they're going to respond to stuff in ways that you might not be able to predict. So if you can listen to them, do that. And if it gets out of hand, just try to, you know, like protect the community that remains. And just as a final question, as someone who's thoroughly involved in medical education and still critical care and through figure one medical entrepreneurship, what are the barriers? I mean, sorry, what, what does the future of what you're doing, um, and what figure one doing look like? Um, there's a, there's a feature that, um, I drew out on a blackboard a bunch of years ago and only two years ago, we were able to actually make it real. And what we did was we took every case that gets uploaded in the descriptions and we fed them through a computer program that matches the words in the, uh, captions to PubMed keywords. These are the mesh keywords that you would use if you were searching PubMed in the mesh, uh, database. And these are the mesh stands for medical subject headings. And that's what key, that's what keywords uh, are built from in medical abstracts. And so we basically built this ontology that was based on the way medical literature is sorted. 
And now we've, we're able to sort our cases just like the way literature is sorted. Um, the secret back door to that is actually going to be unlocked a little bit later this year when we're able to match the cases to pieces of literature, case for other case reports that are published and clinical trials and opinion pieces, whatever's in PubMed, right? Uh, once you can match that to a case, you have this magical app that you can upload a case to, and within a minute, you've got a pile of literature specific to your case, just as if you had searched it. Uh, and so being able to integrate those things and basically make, um, give the cases a bit more, uh, depth and give them some more richness, uh, through the published medical literature, I think makes it more robust, uh, maybe makes it more interesting. Um, certainly makes it more valuable in my opinion. So that's, you know, those sorts of features are things that I'm really looking awesome. forward to Awesome. And seeing. before we run out of time, do you have any pluggables that you'd like to plug? Any social media hashtags? Oh yeah. Um, so you can follow figure one on at figure one on Twitter. You can follow me at Joshua Landy on Twitter, or you can follow me on TikTok at Joshua Landy one. Um, and. I wish I, I wish I had written a book because I, this is like the perfect time to we'll bring you back for that one. We'll but bring you back. Yeah. Yeah. If ne next time I'm on your podcast, there we go. There we go. Ready. And you can find, uh, Macadamian at, at Macadamian labs. Um, thank you for their support. And you can find how it's met at how it's med, um, as well as at how it's med.com. Um, till next time. <laughs>